I think they are talking a high of 67 degrees today. Welcome to day number 18 of harvest, day number eight of corn harvest. Dad said he ran the dryer until two o'clock in the morning last night, and he fired it up about seven this morning, so he didn't get very much sleep. We got the semis empty. Cooper and Zach are already out in the field. They got both the grain carts full, so we're gonna get moving. Cooper wanted to get started at 8.30 this morning. It's 9.15 right now. It was just so dewy. I think he did end up starting at 8.30, but we've plugged the combine in the past. Get, got the sieves all full of a bunch of wet material. It's not a lot of fun getting in there, cleaning that out. But they have everything full. Dad's just trying to get stuff planned for tomorrow because we have two graves that I guess they want them moved. And so we're gonna be digging them up and they've been buried for I think 40 years. So I've never done that before. That's gonna be an interesting day tomorrow. Yes, I know it is wet. Very wet. I thought Cooper got started, but he must not have. Which I'm glad he didn't because this would not go through the machine very well right now. This is literally like I can almost squeeze water out of this. Like that's, that's wet. You gotta be kind of a skinny guy to be able to check the oil on the 340. It's kind of tight for me and I'm not very big. Look at those big old tires just mowing over those corn stalks. Here we are on the North Farm today. We have mile long rows. So it goes from this gravel road over here all the way through until we hit the gravel road over the hill. We're gonna have a full load here on the semi. Ricardo's gonna fill the front half of that. I have 65,000 pounds on me. So I'll be able to fill the back half with 30,000. There'll be another half semi on this. So if Cooper gets going, we get here with the other semi. Ricardo will be full. Then we'll have another semi. Wait a second, why is that one corn stock so much taller than everything else? Just a smidge over 30,000. Ah, sometimes it's just good to know you're not the only one who forgets to shut your trap door sometimes after you pull off the pit and there's a little grain in there that runs out. Dad's been getting, waiting for me to get here. There's a hundred bushels left in the wet holding bin, so we need to be getting some fresh corn in there right away. And right, she's got to shut off the dryer. Okay, that's on. The leg down there is on. You can see the little thing spinning right there. Going into that. Just to make sure that auger gets good and dry, I just got this cracked open. We're going to run it slow for a few minutes here. When we were doing our high management stuff, I had an extra 10 acres of spray. So I decided to come over here to the north farm to run it off, just to sample right down the middle. And all the stuff that's not in that high management strip, testing like 19%. Cooper pulled into the high management strip, it's 25. So we're just trying to figure out how we should address this in the dryer to make sure that we get it dried and not put a big hot spot in the middle of the bin. Because at 25%, our dryer can't really do it the way it's supposed to, and we'd be at probably 300 bushels an hour to get it to like 17. Yeah, you never feel the moisture in it. Yeah. Yeah, I've been just taking the travel. Oh, that's satisfying to watch. Dad's gonna go dump that wet corn in. Oh, he's got a pretty good load there in the back. We got some 25% corn with some 18, 19% corn. So we're just gonna try slowing the dryer down a little bit. That's gonna be the first load of the wet. I'm gonna have the second load of the wet. Well, it's gonna be a blend because Zach's got half dry on him, half wet now. And then there's probably gonna be one more semi of it too. So we're on the dryer slower to get those through and then we'll be able to speed things back up again. It's really easy to think that farming is absolutely, always 100% absolute on everything you do and that you're always making the right decision. And in all reality, there's a lot that we don't understand, there's a lot that we don't know, and there's a lot that we're guessing on, trying to use the best of our knowledge to make the best decision possible. And sometimes you just have to keep things running, so you have to figure stuff out on the fly, which is, kind of what we're doing here. I think if we get that corn, that 25% corn dried down to 17 and a half percent or so, we have a lot of CFMs and the fans that we have on those bins. So we're gonna be getting a lot of air in it and they're gonna be getting like a week's worth of air blown on them. So I think we'll be okay with the weather we have forecasted. We should get it dry enough where we'll be able to store it easily until it's time to be hauled off. Man, look at that, these ears. It looks like we had a beautiful pollination period through here. See how they're nice and uniform? When they're in a nice array like this, that means we had good pollination. If we start getting a bunch of where they start bunching up like this all throughout the ear, that's a sign we didn't get very good pollination. And then also how much it filled up to the tip is also kind of an indicator as well. 
Sometimes if you get poor pollination, it may be pulled like all the way back up to here. And then you just have completely blank cob on the top. But this looks good. Just had a couple bored out at the top, but that is an extremely acceptable ear right there. Looks good. This is Champion 66A22. One of the characteristics of this 116 day hybrid is the fact that it does not dent very much. There is literally almost no dent in these kernels, which is what we like. Makes a nice, heavy kernel. Heavy kernels mean big yields. The whole field would do these. That'd be pretty acceptable. Scott, our mechanic, the really tall one, and his brother Steve. Steve does all of our waterway seeding. That's who's farming right here. Looks like, I don't even know what tractor they're running. Or it might be their dad, Bob. The case 275 and a number for 1015, and then they got a case 5088. Ah, we're a little bottleneck. Dad's still dumping when we got here. With our pit only working at like a third of the capacity that is designed to be at, we're bottlenecked down. The, the benefit of the pit is it kind of acts like another semi driver because you're supposed to be able to just dump in 30 seconds and leave, and then you don't have to sit and babysit anything here. So that way the truck can get back on the road. And so we're able to get away with two trucks when we can dump in 30 seconds and leave because then that basically allows each semi to make a 20 minute round trip. So you can get three loads in an hour between the two trucks, three loads an hour, that's 6,000 bushels an hour, when we can do like 4,000 in a good going field with the combine. So we can keep up in the head. But the way it is right now, we can't keep up. The combine's pumping out more than what the semis can dump. So then the combine sits. Hey, Coop. Hey, I moved closer to the highway here, and I've done a round, and this is going anywhere from 21 to 24. Okay. I just so, checked this load here that just came in, and it's probably about 21. Okay. I want to do a couple of checks in it, just to make sure. Yeah, I just want to get another one, and... I'm gonna slow down the, I'm gonna, I think I'll put the hopper, don't you think, at yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. We're just gonna slow the dryer down a tweak and try that. I just thought about this, the back hopper would have had the other half of the field that had some dry corn mixed in and the front would have been the wet. So I just grabbed another sample and this one's coming in at almost 23%. And then if we do our temperature correction, basically of 60 degrees, we'll just add a point. So we're almost 24% if that's the case, It'll be about there. As much as we like to think the field is all one consistent moisture, it's not. I mean, we haven't had a frost yet, so we're gonna have even more inconsistencies. Plus it was a drought year, so you're gonna have even more because areas that had more water in the soil, maybe a lower spot, a soil type that held water longer perhaps, that is going to have a plant that stayed alive longer. It's gonna hold more moisture versus an area that died sooner and we had a lower moisture. So it, it all averages out. There's Dad in his natural habitat. <laughs> oh my, Zach has a load on him, wow. Sounds like Les and Shane, our bankers, are bringing out lunch today. Hey, hey, what do I go to hey, first? Hey, go to Shane. Are, <laughs> are you driving the other truck today? Do you have your CDL? I do, I left it at home. I can drive it if you really want to. Well, where's your crane at? So you pull it out there. Les and Shane brought out subs. Got some other goodie snacks in there. The case guy just showed up with his truck. So they're running around looking at the combine, figuring out. I believe his name is Cody. I guess while he's in the combine with Cooper, we're already paying $600 for the service call. So. I'm gonna load up on some of these snap-on wrenches while he's not here. In order for anything we are about to talk about to make sense, we need to understand how a combine works. Once corn is harvested, it goes up the feeder house into what's called the rotor. The rotor is a violent process. It spins about 60 miles an hour and these little square things actually knock the corn right off the ear. The trash stays up in the rotor and it passes out the top and it goes through the chopper and then the grain falls down through the little gaps in the concaves 
and it falls onto this bed of augers. This bed of augers simply just moves the grain from the front of the machine to the back of the machine where we are going to separate the grain from the little tiny pieces of trash. This happens on a big old air table that we call the sieves. We have an upper sieve and we have a lower sieve. Once our grain passes through the top sieve and the bottom sieve, it goes to this cross auger which brings us over to our clean grain elevator chain. The clean grain elevator is just how it sounds. It's an elevator that brings grain all the way up into the grain tank. On Cody's preliminary look, he said that our clean grain elevator chain was loose. So the clean grain elevator is what takes the grain from the sieves up into the grain tank. So the paddles on it are supposed to be like this, but they were pointed down like that. So basically as they were going up, grain was just kind of falling in front of it. So it wasn't taking a full scoop each time. And that was causing the clean grain elevator to back leg. And when that back legs, basically it makes grain fall onto the fan which that would explain why we had a nice trail of corn right inside the left track of the combine. It was falling out the drain hole underneath the fan of the combine. So we were overloading that fan, which would explain why when we're going down a hill, we spent a bunch of grain out the back of the machine because the fan was getting more grain falling on it because we were pointing down the hill, so extra was falling on. We'd be losing airflow in the machine, so that air is supposed to blow up through the sieves, kind of like on an air hockey table. It keeps the puck sliding up on top smoothly. Basically, we'd be cutting the air to the air hockey table, so now the cup, the puck sits flat on the table, and then that table goes back and forth and so instead of everything up for loading, the grain falling through, the trash floating out the back, the trash and the grain were just all tied together sitting on the table, shaking it, and just would have pushed it right out the back side of the machine. So that would probably explain it. Hopefully that's what's going on. There can't be a lot of things, but these machines are delicate. You get one little thing out of line, it affects a lot of other stuff. Sometimes things you wouldn't even think about, such as loose clean grain elevator chain. So let me break this down into English. This is the inside of the combine and this is our clean grain elevator chain. Our paddles should be going parallel to the ground just like so, but the way ours are, since they're loose, they're kind of pointed downwards like this. So when they're taking grain up in between inside of here, the grain basically just keeps falling back down, falling back down until it fills this entire bottom area full of grain. Having a pile of grain down here is not really the end of the world, but what is a problem is if we have a pile of grain down here and then we go over a hill and then it falls over this little hump down into the bottom of this little basin because now that grain falls right onto our cleaning fan. And so now we don't have airflow around our cleaning fan. Then we have a little drain hole right here that drips corn down on the ground as we're driving along. It is kind of a double whammy because if this fan gets blocked, then it can't force air through the bottom of the sieves like it's supposed to. So the grain simply just stays up on top of the sieve and it gets walked out with the trash right out of the back of the combine. So now we're dripping grain down here. We're losing a bunch of grain up here and it, things just aren't Aren't working right. On the road again. Cooper's got the end rows of the North Farm off over here, so now we are just on the log rows. This is all North Farm. We'll go all the way past this building site to the next gravel road. This is quite the long rows on this farm. We're, we're still on North Farm here. That's all North Farm. That's all North Farm all the way to that house right on top of the hill. We're boogieing on these long rows here. Well, the case guy's gone, so it's a good sign they're not working on it anymore. Oh, he's got some rows of shame. Oh, he's full full. I take that back, dog. Case guy's still here. Nice and easy. Neighbor Doug, he's the one I took out his mailbox the other day. Sorry, Doug. Looks like Scott, Steve, and Bob got down up there. What's he doing? Survey says. We found the truck. Survey asks, what was the problem? You have two different sized sieves in the back. I guess this side, these sieves are a different size than what's over there. So what did you do? Just cheat one side of the calibration of the sieves open more than the other? Yes. So when we press it, they'll both move the same still, just once right. a little so more? There, there's a centering linkage because they are two 100% separate sieves. Mm -hmm. And there's an adjustment to the linkage on there, which it looks to me like one side's been replaced and one hasn't. And when they put the new sieve in, they didn't match them. Like one of them's a corn sieve and one of them's a regular sieve. The profile's just a little bit different. Okay. So I, to make it right, going for you know if you want to try and get through this year, I understand. But for 
next year, I will get another sim order. Dad just called. He said he went to go to the back to check on the dryer. And look at all the belts we burned off this year already. All them belts are burned off. We've had issue with this from day one. And I don't know how many times it's been worked on from day one. That great auger up there burnt four belts off again. Four belts. Anyway, Dad is working on that, putting the new belts on. We have eight extra ones sitting at the bin site right now, so he's putting four on. Then he'll get four more on order just so we have some extras. Looking at the changes that the case guy made, this is what we're kind of getting on the ground now. So we've got three pieces right up there. We've got a nice clean spot here in the middle. Looks like we got a piece right there. Get a piece there, piece there. I'd call that a pretty acceptable level. Before Cody came, when it was acting up, this is what the ground is looking like behind the combine. That is absolutely horrible. We're leaving an incredible amount of bushels right there. So between the clean grain elevator chain being loose and causing it to back leg, basically throwing grain onto the fan, that was a problem. And then having two different size sieves on the back of the combine. We bought the combine from a family who farms in Iowa, but it seems like everything on it was specced as a wheat combine. It had a small grain pre-sieve. We put a corn pre-sieve on it. And then the back sieves were the smaller ones, which were for wheat. I had the Cody look it up on his computer, uh, what it was spec for when it was bought new. And so one of them is still the wheat sieve and the other one's the corn sieve. When you're looking at them and you don't know what you're looking at, they look similar because you can only see one at a time. But I suppose if we flip the whale tail up on the back and then looked at them real close side by side, then you can notice a difference. I, it, it's subtle, but it's definitely there. So. They ended up opening one up more than the other one. So they're both calibrated now to when you open them, they both move the same, but one is just opened a little bit more than the other because the one is smaller than the other one. So now it seems like it's running better. This is how you know we had a really dry year. That black stuff, that is dried pollen. That has since basically like rotted on the plant. Look at that. <laughs> it never got rained off. There's also no tar spot whatsoever on this leaf. That is interesting. All these leaves over here, pretty stinking clean. That is some minimal tar spot right there. Interesting. A lot more over there on that plant though. Look at all that. Zach is full. He's got like 80,000 pounds on this thing. Mm. No corn going in that. It did it again? Well, no. I mean, I turned oh. them off when I called you. Oh, yeah, there literally is nothing in there in the center. That's not supposed to be there. I think it's that bolt right there came out. It's wedged. Yeah, there's a bolt there. It's probably missing too. Yeah, that bolt's missing too. Yeah. Uh, maybe a pry bar or something just to get a little leverage on it, you know? Yeah. What if we took the impact oh. on that side and tried to back it out? Oh. Ricardo and I are going to run into the store. We're going to get a new one of these. We're actually going to get two of them and we're going to get two washers. Looking at this, that is a, what would that be, a grade five bolt? So this is a soft bolt. I think I'm going to get four bolts that are all grade eight, because right now it has soft ones in there. It looks like they got a new under our first zone builder put together here. That's a big one, wow. We're gonna put the seat belt on, but that's what we got. It's working. We ended up just replacing all four bolts. These were the ones that still had the nut on them, but we can see it was eating into them quite a bit. So I think it was just a matter of time before these ones broke too. Just like that, the sun's starting to go down. We got an absolutely beautiful sunset. Wow. We got the great light, gray freight liner running in action, the great liner. And then we got the red freight liner running in action and dad's in the red Volvo. So we're gonna be running three semis here. Basically, I'm gonna just be hopping between these two. So here, I pulled up, that one's full. They already got a dump on the front half of this one. So when I get back, this one will be full for dad. He might just stay in the red Volvo, who knows, if they already have a load for him when he gets here, he'll probably just fill up. He likes that red one. So here we go. 
It's not that I don't like the Red Freightliner. I do. It's a nice rig. Real clean, simple, easy to use. Nice, clean, spacious cab. What I don't like about it is is the shifting. You just you cannot tell what gear you are in like you can when you're physically putting it in the slot in the gray freight liner. So this is the gear pattern on this one. Whatever transmission that is, I, I'm not a transmission guy, but so I'm gonna go from neutral into first. I'll show you how this works. So look how first and second are in the same slot. We go all the way over, we go all the way back. Okay, now we're in first gear. And then once we get to where we wanna shift, instead of physically moving the lever, we flip that up. And then we let off the throttle and then it shifts into second. And then when we go to third, then we pop it into neutral, we kick that down, now we're in low, and then we go up, now we're in third. Then, ah, let off the gas. Ooh, fourth. It's, it's weird. Something going on in the rear brakes of the red Volvo on the trailer. You have to basically give them air pressure for like three to five minutes before they break free, and sometimes in the morning, You'll have them being fed air for 20 minutes and they still won't release. Once they release, they're fine. But once you pull the thing out again, you're, you're sitting for three minutes before they release. So something is slow letting air back there. I've been driven the Red Volvo for a while. It's like Ricardo's full over there, beautiful sunset. He's gonna be dumping on the Red Freightliner. Dad will pick that up when he gets back. He just took off with the Gray Freightliner. Ooh, we got the moon out right there. And Cooper and Zach are over there. When we're going along in the fall, we gotta be really careful. It's like here we have a wagon in front of us. He doesn't have any lights on the back and he appears that he does not have a reflective triangle. I think he's supposed to. Maybe he does. It looks like he's got two on the side, but they're just not very reflective. But we just gotta be careful when we're going down these roads, flying along, like it's harvest time. Slow moving equipment's out here. You don't wanna run into the back of that. The farmer doesn't want you to run into the back of that, but you really don't want to, because you probably won't survive that if you hit it fast. So just, just take your time. They're going as fast as they can, and they're trying to be careful. We put in a warranty claim on that light. They're supposed to be sending a new one out. It just hasn't got here yet, but it keeps flashing on us for some reason. Right now it's off. So something's going on in it. Ooh, looks like Dad had a little spill. One of these will shut the truck off if I pull it. I think I have to do that. Undo the ones with the trailer, keep the ones on the truck on in order to keep the truck running. Both the red Volvo and the white Volvo used to be delivery trucks and they would just haul like 40,000 pound loads around. So just kind of light stuff, like they have nine inch clutches in them. So weren't very heavy duty items, but they have like a idle sensor on them or something, a timer. So if you let it idle for about five minutes, it'll just shut off. So you'll get in, all the lights and everything will be on but the engine will be off. So the way around it on the red Volvo here is you have to leave the brakes on on the truck. So like you have to keep supplying air to the brakes on the truck, but then we lock the ones on the trailer. While we were dumping that truck, ran into the kitchen. Neva made me some food. Looks like we got 450 grams of rice, five and a half ounces of ground beef, two easy over eggs, a little bit of salsa, and there's a couple carrots hiding in there somewhere, right there. The corn we've been in has been kind of testing that 22% or so. Our dryer can't do anything over 24, otherwise you're running about 300 bushels an hour at 24. If you slow it down anymore, the dryer literally stops feeding out of the bottom. So we got that bin up to about there, which is as comfortable as we're, as comfortable as we are to fill it to. That doesn't sound right. We're comfortable filling it up to that point and that's it. And that's where it's at. We don't want to put anything in this tonight because we're going to have the semis full and we're just going to be bottlenecked in the morning because the dryer's just pumping slow. So it's just about nine o'clock. We're going to go get everything out of the field and bring it back here and try to run this for a little bit. Kind of nice being able to run the dryer during the day when it's 65 degrees and sunny because you don't have to pump nearly as much heat into it. And you're also not fighting the dew of the night. When the dew starts to set into the air at night, you're basically working the dryer twice as hard because you're also trying to dry the wet air that you're sucking in through the grain for during the day when you have some nice dry air. Then 
you just have a more efficient dryer burning a lot less gas and you can push a few more bushels per hour through got the great freightliner empty now yeah what trucks out there the red volvo that one's full this is going to be full once we get out there Ugh. I'm no shit. Just to kind of put stuff into a little bit of perspective, it cost us like $18,000 to crane our wet holding bin over. And when we built the wet holding bin, it was like $45,000. So let's just say $70,000 for the wet holding bin by the time you figure all the labor, electricity, and all that kind of stuff. And then we have another $70,000 in the pit. So we have $140,000 in two items that we really can't use at all right now. So, you know, just imagine something you got that was $100 and didn't work the way it was supposed to and the way you felt about that. And then now, imagine it being $140,000. Dad's gonna let the hopper bin back there run for another two hours. That semi's full sitting on the pit. We got the gray Freightliner full and then we got the red Volvo in the back full. In the morning, Dad and I have to go dig up two graves that have been buried for 40 years and the family wants to move them to a different location. So Cooper's gonna babysit this stuff in the morning. So that way, hopefully by the time we get done with that grave, or those two graves, I, I don't even know if we'd wanna call it a grave because we're not burying anybody, we're digging them up. But then hopefully by the time we get done with that, then basically everything will be kind of running empty here. And then we'll be able to take off again and keep going. Sounds like Cooper was able to find a new sieve to replace the what the wheat one that's in the combine. So then we'll have all corn ones on it. Ryan, the combine mechanic, was picking that up. I don't know if he's coming out tomorrow to put that on or what the plan is. But we have one. We got about 50 acres done today. So for all the little run around and for the wet corn, not being able to run the dryer very fast and all the little breakdowns and stuff we had today. I mean, 50 acres. That's a solid running day. I know we want to get 150 acres a day done, but we'll take 50, because it's better than 40, which is better than 10. Which is better than zero. All right, that's all we got for today. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one.